we make a world in crisis. My name is Austin Royal Lake, and I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, CCAM. And uh, tonight we're going to be having an incredible lineup of speakers joining me on the panel. And we're going to be diving into a conversation around climate justice and also a conversation about how we can live in balance with our sacred mother earth and each other. And that's really what we want to get at tonight, and looking at root causes of the poly crisis we're in and an intersectional analysis of this moment in time. And um, it's also an honor to be here with you um, to join me in this event, which is also a pre-launch event for my new book that will be coming out in January called The Story Is In Our Bones. Um, how we're all going to and to the crisis. Thank you. So it's climate week and we thought it would be a good time to share this work um, that will be coming out in January and start the conversation now. There's the ever now right now going on. Um, and I wanted to start the evening in a very special way. Um, I can't tell you how much Casey Camp Hornick from the Punk Nation means to me. She's my mentor, she's my relative, someone who I love so, so dearly. And she is a voice that we all need to learn from and listen to. Um, so much so that I asked her to write the forward to my book, which I am incredibly honored that she did so. And we're going to have her um, open this evening in a traditional way. And with that, please come to the front, Casey Camp Hornick. that I was um, really looking forward to this moment to be here with you. And I'm, I'm very grateful to be here as well. There's a song, and it's very strange how, you know, I get punk songs usually in my head. But as I was coming from the there to be two. <laughs> as I was coming up the elevator, Today, my girl over here, and we were 
were seeing the crowds of people, and she was talking about having lunch in the park, I was realizing that all of those that are walking these streets and living way up there and way down underneath the earth and then travel like that, it's a natural thing that sometimes this environmental change is something they don't even relate to because they don't have the moment to talk to her and to listen to her. They don't have that moment to understand the sacredness of her breath because they're just trying to breathe through this exhaust. They don't have the understanding that we're trying to bring forth you and I at the sacred moment. So which way is west from here? I could tell you when I was home in the country. Show me again. Join me in my prayer, if you would, please. To the west. And the nation. As we look towards the west at this time and we see the setting sun in our mind's eye, we're also aware that the Thunder Nation is asking us to understand the power that is coming within the Thunder Nation of the sacred way, of the sacred fire, and that within it carries the peace, the instruction, and the ways as the eagle carries the fire air and the water on its wings and brings so those strong storms to purify. As we look to the west, as far as we can, we send our blessings and we accept the blessings that are offered to us at this time. And we ask for help. And we ask for help. To the north, as the seasons change on this equinox, and we look to the north for the cold winds that are coming, that the white wolf that sends those, we're asking for your strength to imbue us with the abilities to go inside ourselves, like we go inside our lodges in the winter time and tell the healing stories, the teaching stories, the stories of the generations past and the ones that we want for the generations to come. We ask White Wolf of Winter that as we have this harvest season and then we have you come into our lives, that you will help us to understand the need for the cold, white wind to stay strong and for that Arctic circle to be able to remain as deep and deep and deep of ice as it always has been. We offer ourselves to you to help us to change the ways that we look for comfort and understand with your season, our strength will grow as our spirits grow in the sacred moment of the white wolf. Thank you. To the east. To the east where the sun rose today and gave us this moment to make our way into this world of light and to choose what it is that you ask of us and which of those tasks we will be honored to carry out. To the morning star, to those who are wise enough to get up and listen to your message, we ask that you pity us as the kind of humans that might sleep in and not look at you and understand that it's important every day to wake up and say thank you and ask for guidance. We look to the east and we see our grandmother moon as well. And all of those that are willing to show us how to live within the rhythms of life and its natural laws. And we thank you for this day. To the south, to the south winds of growth that have been with us since this portion of Mother Earth has lived in spring and summer. We ask you to look at the growth, not the waves that we turn away where our creature comes, but look at the growth that has come on the warm winds, where the plant life, the corn, and all the relatives, the sacred trees, the very grasses, 
are the ones that then grow and give us breath for breath for breath for breath, the sacred air that we have. And we look south to our relatives down in the mountains and the Amazons and all of those places where they maintain the beauty way. We ask that as we look this way, that that place called Antarctica also continues to maintain itself within the laws of the natural laws that have always been in place. We pray for you and for all your relations there, and we ask you to help us. Above us, Wakanda, Star Nation, Moon Mother, Father, Son, Winged Ones of all nations. We look up and we see beauty. We pray that you might look at us and see beauty as well. As we emerge, as the butterfly emerges, to be able to be part of this natural life and to recognize every second the gift of life that is given to us. And we thank you for that. Below us, Earth Mother, you are everything. The one mother we all share. We thank you for helping us to emerge from our mother's wounds. We thank you for the food that you offer, for the sacred water from your breast, for the ability to walk with you, not upon you, but to walk with you into this life of abundance that you have provided for us. And help us to understand that it's never right for anyone to go hungry when you have provided so much. My girl was pretty happy. There we want to make the sharing of the bounty, the unconditional love, the unceasing nurture, no matter what we do as your children who have erred and walked away from the red road, guide us all the way from the creepy crawlers to the cool of the fire that lives within through the sacred stone nation and more and more and more. Through your sacred waters that connect all. We ask you to guide us this day. Thank you. 
a critical choice point that I think we need to welcome the unexpected. And that's why I shared that story with you. We need unexpected things to happen right now because we're in such an incredible crisis at every level. The dominant cultural world worldview informed by colonization, patriarchy, capitalism, and racism is displaying a horrific relationship with nature and each other, and it's devastatingly out of balance and unjust. Um, and if we're going to change things, both now and in the future, it's imperative that we really change the narrative and where we're coming from, because we need to dig into the roots of how we got into these crises, which means dealing with all of these issues that have been historically uh, different systems of oppression that we're all dealing with in different ways. And I want to particularly lift up indigenous, black, and brown women, which are primarily the women that we support in our organization of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, because they're truly on the front lines of this, these intersectional crises and oppressions. We have to move out from an extractivist, colonial system into a system of globally conscious, respecting relationship and reciprocity with each other in the land. Tonight, on the cusp of the autumn equinox, we have these incredible leaders who we're going to be hearing from and getting into a deeper delve conversation on, on worldviews, on system change, and share some knowledge. Like, let's dig in and get into some knowledge about what is the world we want to create, not what is the definition of the just transition that has been discussed all week long, that's starting to get co-opted by governments like they usually do in corporations. Our version of what the future is we want which is very different. It's things like creating community and feeding each other and building beautiful lodges and having ceremony. Our future of what we think is good for our communities and where the power should be placed is very different than the vision that I saw when I went into the climate uh, talks, uh, excuse me, the um, Climate Admission Summit earlier this week. So we're gonna get into that conversation, but um, before I introduce our moderator who's going to come up and then introduce all of our guests. Um, I want to thank our incredible organizing team who have put literally countless hours and beautiful heart and soul into producing this event. And I want to particularly name Catherine Quaid, Ashley Bargado from Nikan, and Harriet Sugarman from Climate Mamas, and all of the wonderful volunteers that Harriet has brought together, and Natalie Conan for her beautiful organizing of the catering. So let's give them a round of applause. And we are going to build a powerful movement together based on principles of justice, love, and a fierce dedication to our planet and our communities. That's what I'm doing here in New York, and I hope that's what you're doing here as well. And with that, I would like to invite Antonia Juhas up to the stage here. She's Human Rights Watch Senior Researcher and Investigative Journalist and a dear friend. And she's going to introduce our panelists. We're going to hear from everyone. And then um, when that's complete, I'm just going to share a few details, a sneak peek into the book, just very shortly at the end. Antonia.
and my organization defends human rights, which means we defend people against the fossil fuel industry. Industry by trying to end it. <laughs> Reasonable. My job's reason. How about you? <laughs> um, but I'm also an investigative journalist, and that is uh, also focusing on fossil fuels, and that's been the incredible journey that I've been able to take and meet so many of the amazing, beautiful, powerful, um, inspirational women who you're going to hear from tonight. And I have the blessed opportunity of being Oh, darn, it happens to the Feminist Notebook. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, to bring these amazing women up here uh, with you tonight. So first, I'm going to ask you up in order that you'll be speaking. Um, first, Kalina Guolinga is a member of the Vigilant Nation from Sarayaku, Ecuador, and is an indigenous leader, climate justice leader. Kalina, please join us. Jackie is the founder and executive director of the Chisholm Legacy Project. And Jackie will come to the Osprey, are you also going to be wonderful? Okay. And <clears throat> Osprey Oriel Lake, you've already met, the founder and executive director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, We Can. Nation Environmental Ambassador and a member of the board of WeCam. <laughs> All right, so we have the wonderful journey tonight of looking at um, how to tell stories, how to communicate our desire and our ability to create climate justice and create the world that for some of us is already that, um, that place that we have been, that others are hoping for, and that can help others achieve that, that place and that change. And to start us off tonight, we're, I'm going to ask a question to everyone on the panel and give you some time to answer it. I'll probably follow up with another question and then give you some time to answer it as, as you feel inspired to do so. And then we'll see where the conversation takes us. And we have a timekeeper who's going to give you a little flag. Um, in, in Ecuador, there's uh, unfortunately there's a lot of 
racism towards indigenous peoples, and if there's a lot of just disinformation or just too little knowledge. And so I really wanted to just show that okay, we have these problems with the oil industry and mining and a lot of a lot of issues and threats to our communities, but there's also so much beauty in our communities and how can we um, share those to simultaneously. And so it was also the time you know, where social media had already become a thing and you can share that through social media. Um, and I think a lot of young people started to do that at the same time, which I think that now you know, like almost 10 years, 10 years later, I think it, a lot has shifted. Like there's been like narrative shifts. And I think that's also why we are, you know, we're talking about indigenous peoples as guardians of the forest. It's kind of, I mean, not everyone recognizes it, but especially like in the environmental spaces, I think we've already kind of come to a, um, a consensus that indigenous peoples are crucial to protect the down and I think that is, I mean, the, the contribution of, of indigenous people, both elderly and, and, and younger generations, I think really have pushed towards that direction. Um, and, and that also implies that, well, if we are, uh, and because we are guardians or uh, custodians, whatever you want to call it, of these places, then we are actually the ones who should be making decisions over our territories and our lands. Um, and that takes us in that step. Okay, well, now we know that this is true. Now we should get people to uh, decision on this basis. Um, but that's not enough either. It's we, we actually need to make sure that indigenous peoples, and particularly indigenous women, who have a crucial role in, in our communities, also have, have support. And that often means financial support. Um, so that we're fully equipped to carry out the work that we do, uh, so that we are prepared and um, have the resources to do so. And, and, and I think that is, you know, those three can come together, right, in one token. But the purpose is that we can protect indigenous peoples, make sure that you know, indigenous peoples are not killed for the work that we do, and also uh, that we can continue the work uh, protecting those other peoples. I don't know if that was so it's a wonderful <laughs> answer. I'm actually going to moderate the privilege and ask you a quick follow-up. Um, what do you think accounts for that shift? Because it sounds like when you were talking about that shift in listening to the necessity of prioritizing indigenous communities as the guardians of the earth. It sounds to me like you would have been fairly rapidly. I mean, I would have to ask uh, Casey what she thinks, how she has experienced it. But I guess um, I grew up with the stories of what it was like before my mom, for example, and then what it was like for me when I was a kid, and uh, and now the, the difference now. And I think in the past, I would say a lot has shifted, and the narrative a lot has shifted in the past ten years. Uh, that is my experience, uh, and I, I do think that the like the force of storytelling that Indigenous peoples have had has really pushed that. Um, and I think we've really like made sure that okay, well, we're here to stay, and, and you need to listen to what we have to say. Can you talk about how that played into the recent success with yesterday and what that success was? Yeah. Um, so in on the 20th of August, Ecuadorians uh, voted on a uh, it was, there was a national referendum on an oil project. So basically, it was the first time that a country was voting on an uh, on extraction of resources of oil, let alone an active pro an, an active project. And um, and this for this to happen, it was a ten year long process, which I did not participate in, but a lot of other um, young people that are older than me participated in. Um, and and then, but we were part of uh, pushing the campaign for the votes. Um, and Nathalie has been part of that process, she's sitting right here, uh, both in the campaign and before it. Um, and I, I think when we realized that this referendum was taking place, um, the reason why it didn't take place 10 years ago was because there was a lot of corruption and they didn't let it happen. And that out of nowhere, we were told that this is gonna take place in August and we had two months to prepare for it, right? And so me and my 
friends, we came together and said, okay, this is like the biggest moment in like climate, not just in Ecuador, but like like in the world, where our country's gonna vote on an existing and active oil project in the Amazon rainforest and in a place that is considered to be the most biodiverse place on the planet. And so, okay, what are we good at? And we are good at communicating. Um, so we we came together and we started to think about, okay, what kind of strategies and messaging can we, are we gonna use? So we, we broke it down to very simple language um, to what does this mean um, and, and what actually is this? And so it was the first case of climate democracy um, and it was, uh, and it would be like an incredibly important president for Ecuador and also for the world. And those I think were the two things that we really tried to push had to go into a more technical language for voters and so on. Um, but, um, so I, I, I think I have like one minute left, but um, I think that was kind of what we tried to do, and then we used, obviously, both social media and then traditional media to reach out as, as, to as many voters as, as possible. Um, and I do think a lot of young people, well, oh, yeah, a lot of young people are part of like, shaping that narrative
One of the things that I find really challenging about this time, but also um, exciting, and what really interests me a lot, what I'm really interested in getting at, is that we don't we don't have the politics in place to address the crisis at hand. It's just not there. The politics are not there. And so that's why I wanted to have this conversation, why I've worked um, on some new programs that we can and writing this book is because this moment calls for something much bigger than our governments are prepared to deal with. And what I find hope in and the messages that I would put it maybe even in plural, plural the messages that I'm interested in that I'm conveying but also I'm welcoming in our women's networks around the world and, and with gender diverse leaders is that the people are doing the work. You know, people are growing their food. People are building solar in their local communities. I was blown out by a woman um, from Uprose who was on one of our panels this week about, you know, kind of these communities growing up out of the cement, you know, of oppression and physical fact of city cement and living, living near the freeway and building gardens and building infrastructure for themselves. And so, you know, we work with a lot of communities in different countries and I see amazing work being done by men and women, but we're very much focused on women. Uh, you know, from the Sadiaco community and the women's leadership there with Casey and her community, and I could name so many more. Monique Verdon is working with incredible farmers on the Gulf South. Uh, we have a project in DR Congo with women reforesting an entire area and protecting 1.6 million acres of old growth forest. I could go on and on. So for me, the excitement is the people are doing the work. I trust in you, I trust in us to do the things that need to be done. But to me, the obstacle is that the people in power, so to speak, not that they are powerful, the people who have really um, stolen the power, if you will, and are really being a system of oppression for the rest of us, um, are interfering with us doing our work. So we have you know, this fossil fuel industry, which is, I'm bringing that up since it's been such a focus for this week, and I want to echo that as we continue on in this conversation. You know, we need to end the era of fossil fuels, period. We need to shut this industry down. And it, along with that, many other things will come because right now, um, our, we're, you know, first and foremost, frontline communities are being literally killed by the fossil fuel industry. We just came out with a report this week on the gender and racial impacts of the fossil fuel industry and the complicit financiers of that uh, industry. And, you know, so we spent months and months researching the impact in communities of fossil fuels on women's health. And, I mention this because this is insane. It's not like there is climate change coming. First of all, we're in climate change with droughts and floods and um, you know all of the kinds of things we're seeing in climate disruption already. But this industry has already been killing us for a really long time, especially indigenous black and brown communities. And so I'm really interested in how we disrupt and dismantle the system and how we really get our governments to take responsibility, get some accountability, and stand up to this industry. Because enough is enough, it's enough. It, it has to stop. And so it was really, uh, I, I kind of had a, a little sweet moment on Wednesday, not that I think a lot happened at the Climate Ambition Summit. I was very honored, totally randomly probably, to be chosen by, um, to be part of the civil society that was allowed inside to the summit, which was very similar to a lot of the, the climate talk negotiations sort of throughout. But what I did like is that um, the United States, China, and some other big polluting countries were not allowed to speak. <laughs> I love that. I, they were not allowed to have the microphone because they are not, and the United States is not, reducing fossil fuels, and that was the, the ticket to entry, if you will, to get the microphone that was set up by the UN Secretary General is you've got to be actively stopping fossil fuel expansion. So now, that's not everything, but it's a little nice crap, and I was really happy for it because you know we have to start building on this. We have to start building on these victories that happened in Sadiako. 
we have to start building on these victories every time we see one of these fossil fuel projects going down. And you know, it's hard. A lot of us have been, you know, at Standing Rock, line five, line three, you know, standing up in other countries to stop these projects. And you know, it's it's not it's not easy work. It's heartbreaking because a lot of these projects do go through. But we have to keep fighting because we are winning. I truly believe we are winning. I wouldn't just say that. I truly believe we are winning. And this is where I want to just shift for a minute before my time is up to say that it's not enough even if we have that win because the dynamics that got us into that situation have to be changed. And that's why I was saying earlier, how did we get into the climate crisis and this fossil fuel industry having so much power is because of colonization, because of an economic system that is devouring our planet and is rapacious called capitalism, but it could be other names, but capitalism, because of racism and the fact that there has to be places where these terrible, um, dirty projects can take place. They have to happen someplace. And because of patriarchy, because I guarantee you, I have sat in so many women's circles, and if women were leading our countries right now, a lot of this work would get done. And I'm not saying women have all the answers, but there's terrible imbalance that's been going on, and it has led to a lot of atrocities. And we need to give power and strength to all the women who are leadership roles and uplift them all over the world, especially indigenous and black, brown women. So I'm really interested in getting into this conversation about world view and how we got into the situation where we are living in this insanity. We're blowing up the planet, we're burning the planet, and at the same time as Casey so beautifully said in her prayer, which was so healing after this week of so many meetings and running around, is that, um, you know, who's looking up at the stars? Who's remembering? that we wouldn't have food without the sacred water and soil and these seeds. These are gifts from Mother Earth. And I'm interested in how we regrow and regroup ourselves past these systems I've been talking about into real things like water and friendship and love and justice and creativity and healing and connecting. That's what I like to see as a relationship world being reborn and that everything and everyone is a relative, which we are. And we remember who we are, and we bring back our legacy as noble and strong and respectful human beings. That's what I'd like to see in my message going out to the world. Thank you. Thank you. And just to remind me of the question if you want, the key message that you're trying to convey through your work and how you're doing it and any obstacles you want to You know, it's a really huge and very small question. Um, and I, I so appreciate what's been said here and the incredible work that's happening. And yours as well. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, I think that there's any number of ways that the story has to be told. And that's what we're talking about is this storytelling moment. I was looking at each one of you whenever these stories were being told. And I was imagining your story. I was imagining your ancestors' story. And I was imagining what story you will want told about you from the next generations to come, knowing that you were alive in this time of purification that is being called climate change. And I know that your progeny is going to say you took action, you were here, you cared, you cleared a path for them. I know that because you wouldn't be here if you weren't of a like mind right now. So stories kind of have sustained us as people, the indigenous people. And, and there are so many reminders of that. I was listening to Ariel from uh, the Climate Action Group and North of the Medicine Line and what they call Canada nowadays, young woman that I've watched grow up 
you know, from the time that she was a young woman like her, um, growing into the positions that you, you have assumed, because all power is assumed power. These children, these young people, assumed the power that they knew was the correct one. They partnered with their traditional ways. They partnered with the stories that were kept for them. They partnered with the knowledge that their ancestors gave them about the values of the living forest, about the values of Mother Earth and the medicines that she provides within the living forest. We had the honor of visiting that territory, of, of hanging out with uh, Garn, the Global Alliance on the Rights of Nature, in that territory. That was the first country to include that in the Constitution and on and on and on. And, and I was thinking, you know, in, in terms of the Ponca, that uh, we were told from the time I was very young, I was born in 1948. My mother was born in 1914, among the first generation to be born in captivity on a reservation, which is a POW camp, that you're killed if you leave that territory. My grandfather and grandmother were part of the generation that were forcibly removed from the territory where uh, Wakanda, the Great Spirit, had placed us to caretake. Over a series of five trees, we ceded over uh, two and a quarter million acres to the federal government in Nebraska and South Dakota in order to stay in a small township. Well, they still murdered us. They still made a trail of tears happen for my people where one in three of us died. And the stories that came from that were the stories that I remember. I remember my mother's auntie, uh, one of them called her. Uh, in our language, it was the blind auntie because during that trip she got dirt in her eyes and wasn't allowed even water to wash her eyes with. And at the same time, she carried the body of her dead brother, her younger brother, for 700 miles. I was told a story about another auntie on that walk that carried four stones with her that were from the sacred fireplace that was our prayer circle up in the northern country so that our prayers would continue. That's who my people are. That's, that's the stories that I come from. They also spoke of this time of prophecy. And one that I was uncomfortable with, because as a young woman following on the civil rights heels, we ignited a red power movement. And part of that was the American Indian Movement. And I had the honor of being the younger sister of four powerful brothers and a big sis and a mom and a dad that were all part of that change. <laughs> You're fine. And she, uh, when those times were going on, uh, the Spirit Nation was speaking to us in the ways that they do. And all of you hear that. All of you feel that and you know it. Sometimes this, this colonized world makes you deny it. But your uh, intuition or whatever that is that brings your awareness of your spirit into action is, is what we listen to. And there are those with the gift, Yeska, they call them translators, <laughs> that tell us what the spirits are directly telling. And they told us there would be a time of prophecy during my lifetime where the Red Nation's people would be required to stand up from the, the northern quadrant of uh, Antarctica all the way through what is now called the Americas, <laughs> down into the tip of Chile. And that those peoples would be the ones to lift the voice, to remind people of what all of the roots are and were. 
where you originally came from and your original instructions were how to live with a farm, with a, with a garden in your backyard, with a way that you didn't dirty the waters around you, with respect for the four legs that were going to give you meat and the rooted ones that were going to feed you, and respect for the air that was out there so that it could continue to be the breath of the seven generations to come. All of those things are prophecy. Many in my generation were reluctant to say, who, us? Now they call it traditional <coughs> wisdom. Now they bring us into the UN. I wanted to also bring to mind what Ariel was telling us a few days ago. Here we're in this UN space where we're meeting with them this morning about COP23. And they were asking us, what do you indigenous people want to have take place there? And one of the things I told them, well, you know, rights of nature has to be recognized. That has to be recognized. Because human beings are nature. We're not a separate beings. We're not just land protectors water protectors. We are nature protecting itself because our species is in danger of, of removing itself from the very existence. But what I found out from Ariel that really spurred me to, to pay more attention to why they're listening stronger now is not only just for survival, it is for survival by the way, but also because the largest contingency that comes to the UN is the fossil fuel people, right? The largest contingency. They are everywhere in every meeting. You know who the second largest contingency is? Indigenous people. So we are to that point, through the stories, through the prophecies, and through the understanding that we are now in the position, in our position, to lead back to the rights of nature, where we no longer even use the word resource. Everything is a source of life. Everything is a source of life. Cannot be looked at simply as, as a resource. I also work as an actress, so I do some, some acting and things that also are showing the revitalization, and they're part of the storytelling of indigenous uh, writers and directors like Preservation Dogs, right? Woo and like that, uh, there's one coming up that's Avatar The Last Airbender. They're looking at Grandman. <laughs> <laughs> and then in November, there's a show called Found on NBC that's a brand new series. And the uh, seventh episode is Missing Wild Indigenous. And it deals with the missing and stolen women as a result of the fossil fuel people. And it, just a quick reminder, call them out. These are mass murderers. These are serial killers that should not be allowed to continue. So many times, and it's like 
like we're not put on the front line or in the front of the marches. We are on the front lines of where the real stuff happens, and not just out like out in the streets on the marches, but also you know protecting our lands back home. Um, and so I think that yeah, we need to like shift the language around that. And um, yeah, like basically we all just need to recognize that we literally are depending on a, on, on a planet that is still surviving thanks to indigenous peoples, right? Like, they, like it, there literally would not be a, a planet left if there, were, if there wasn't indigenous peoples that have sacrificed their own lives for it. And I, like, I, there is some vague recognition, I think, and we're, we're getting there, but, but I think like it's, it's we really need to put it out there that, uh, I mean, there are statistics, right? Like, five, indigenous people are 5% of the world's population, but then, but we uh, protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. Where I come from, the vast majority, I think, uh, of pristine rainforest, I think it's like also 80, 85% um, of, of the pristine rainforest in my area is also on indigenous people's lands, and that's just, it's not just where we come from, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, that, it, it, and why, why are the people who, who everyone is now depending on not having the right support and the right resources? Um, it's, it's incredibly disturbing. You know? And what we've been able to do without having the access to that, those kinds of resources. Um, and, and yeah, I think that's where where we need to see a shift and we need to do it What do you think that would, would look like? What's needed to help make that shift? And, and what are things that you feel um, indigenous movements that you're a part of are doing to make that happen? What is needed for it to happen, for resources to go to indigenous peoples? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there's a, a lot of pledges that uh, and commitments and promises that have been um, have been made in the past few years, but it's not necessarily reaching the right people. Um, it often goes through government structures or other kind of like bigger organizations, and then often these resources just get lost. And that's why it's important to work directly with communities and people on the ground. So I think there needs to be like some kind of change in, in, in how we deploy those resources. Do you think that something worked well, again, giving you a chance to talk about um, yesterday again, something unique that worked well there in terms of who was given voice, platform, the ability to tell story, the way the story was told, is that also an example of something that worked well? I think to have less than two months to put together a national campaign to reach like like over 10 million voters, I think we did pretty good. Um, but we definitely would have had done better if we had uh, if we had more time and had more resources. I can only speak for what we were doing, but we worked with zero dollars for the entire campaign. And um, and so yeah, I think I think there could definitely be improvements up there, but. So we also had a very, very little time, and I think what did work, what, what we depended on, was basically that I could call my friend in the middle of the night and say, I need this for like seven, seven, eight, 7 a.m. tomorrow, and my friend would have it. And um, that's how we worked during two months. And, um, and I think there was a lot of uh, collaboration with different movements, um, both indigenous peoples and uh, like movements from like more urban movements. Um, and I guess like we were in a quite like difficult position because we were we were managing a lot of the communication that was having like far outreach and then we had to also deal with kind of the um, uh, staying in touch with all these different movements and making sure that everyone was happy to get the hard sometimes. So we were we were in a like a we had to um, I was called like manage this conversation very delicately uh, and making 
ensure that as the people that we're maintaining a lot of communication, we don't end up gatekeeping as often as it often happens. So I just being very careful, careful with those things. Do you want to describe really quickly because I've had you sort of brush through it in the in the minute at the at the end what the um, moratorium was and what the vote was? Um, so what we voted on? Yeah. What actually when I say the yes to victory, what it actually means? Yeah. So yeah, the Yosemite National Park is the biggest national park in Ecuador, um, and within it there are nine oil blocks. And then what an oil block means basically a piece on the map. The, the government says that this is an oil block, and here you're, you're at, at certain com uh, specific companies allowed to drill oil. And so a government, the, the government-owned oil company had an active oil project there. Um, and thanks to a national referendum that was called, uh, that was, that young people, because it, like, I don't know exactly how to explain this, but basically what happened is that young people gathered a bunch of signatures, almost 800,000, um, 10 years ago, and because of that, they were able to call for a national referendum. Because of corruption, it didn't take place 10 years ago, but it did take place this year in August. And so, uh, if the yes vote had won, which was to uh, stop exploiting oil there, then the government would need to, uh, you know, uh, like close all the oil wells in this specific oil block and basically leave no traces behind. And because it, it does come from a, like a Supreme Court sentence, uh, it's also binding for the government. So if the government doesn't comply with the sentence and with the outcome of the referendum, then they will be impeached, basically in theory, um, and you know, we need to make sure that they actually now follow through with, with um, what is expected of them with the outcome of the So basically, this, this place should be um, accepted in, in, a, in a few years from the exploitation. And it is the first case of it, so it's, it's pretty incredible. And I mean, we saw how many people you know, were just marching here in New York to, and to, for the face out of fossil fuels. And it's the first country that is actually doing it, not just not expanding on fossil fuel, but actually also like, closing existing oil projects. And um, rich countries as the US, China, and you know, uh, should be doing this. It's, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be on a country like Ecuador just to begin this. But now that we are doing it, we do need kind of a, a global community that engages. Um, and supporting this process so that it doesn't fail. Because it's not like we won and now we can just be like, oh, we're protecting the forest and you know, live happily ever after. We need to make sure that there, we actually, you know, there's, there's a financial gap now in the country. There's a lot of people who are depending on that for jobs. Um, and people who have made dependent on it for water, for education, we cannot just abandon them. And that's where the, the challenge is right now to make sure that this isn't a failure so that
continue to give more examples. Do you like or give examples of something that has worked well if you want to or take the question in another direction? No. Um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think examples, unfortunately, I wish that there were more examples um, of really doing it in a meaningful and deep way. I, I think this is the this is the problem. I mean, um, that they're, yeah. I, so, uh, some organizations have asked me in the past, like, what it would really look like for them to be accountable. And so, when I share these examples, you know, their, their eyes got me glaze over in terms of like what they could do. And there's just nothing close to being willing to do that. Um, so it's it's hard. Um, it's it's very hard. And so people will point to their boards, or they'll you know, point to all these reasons why they can't do it. And so it's. I don't know. Uh, I'm not really good at taking them in a whole different direction. So maybe you can No, 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 you don't. You know, no, that's excellent. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask you to talk more about the Chisholm Legacy Project and what brought you to found it and lead it and what's happened. It's developed so rapidly. And what we're talking about the work that you're doing and what encouraged you to start a new organization. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I was with the NACP for 11 years. And during that time, um, Shirley Chisholm's kind of her campaign slogan, which is unbought and unbossed, kind of became our rallying cry at the at the end of, at the end of this meeting when our various communities would be kind of subject to attempts at co-optation by fossil fuel industries and others. And so it, it enabled us to, to then lift up the folks who we were able to resist as examples of of what's possible, um, that they're able to resist and still be able to, to have what they need to be able to serve their communities. And so that, but it became uh, harder and harder for people to resist because the circumstances in communities were so dire and so it was, it was hard for people to get the resources that they needed to be able to, to help their communities. This one um, branch came to us and they said that they were, they were showing us an agreement for review with the legal department, which they showed, shared it with me. And it was an agreement where they would get $10,000 per year for the next 10 years from this company that wanted to build a, um, to, 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 to develop a landfill, but it was on top of the water aquifer <laughs> for the community. And so we were like, yeah, that's not. You know, and so they were like, they want to, they want to um, support the children. You know, this kind of, uh, you know, toys of the children. You know, so the people, you know, there's that level of desperation. It was a small, small branch, and uh, and so it, so people prey on that. And so, but it's just a legacy project. They really wanted to 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 rise to a level of being able to to really push back on the extractive economy in a, in a very explicit way. We didn't, want, we didn't want to be in a situation where we're helping black folks to be better capitalists, but instead to really think about dismantling the system that's just not working for us and is not going to work for us. And so, so really stepping out in that sense was the idea. So with the Children's Legacy Project, we, we are uh, putting forward and explicitly capitalist agenda, but of course explicitly um, regenerative solidarity, living economy agenda, and, and while working with communities to build those kinds of microcosms at the local level, but also to come together around what that can look like in terms of transforming our society at large to be a regenerative economy. So that's really where we're at. Thank you. Thank you very much.
mean, I think that, um, you know, in our movements, our movements are getting so powerful, uh, you know, in terms of the language that we're using, how we're teaching each other. I mean, every time, you know, we collect, whether we go to the climate talks or this week, and I hear these stories from my sisters um, and go to all these different events, it's, it's incredibly inspiring, but also it's like we're having this massive teaching, really. To, to move our conversation along, and I find it really exciting because um, it really moves an agenda, and that's where I think narrative and the storytelling really does help, because I'm learning so much, and it makes my mind shift and say, okay, this is where I can push further. This is another intervention, or I haven't thought of that. And so um, I think that, you know, culturally, in our movements, we're getting much more powerful. Many of us are doing land acknowledgements. Nobody was doing that before. You know, um, there's there's so much I've learned from from all of my colleagues sitting here in friends. Um, so I think that in our movement spaces we're going stronger and stronger. And but I would also say on the other end of the spectrum, as we get stronger, the tension is increasing, and the racism, and the colonization, and the pushback uh, by industry and extractive models of economics are also getting stronger. And that's this amazing tension point we're in. Um, you know, just to cite one example, we do work on fossil fuel divestment in our organization. And, um, you know, there, whether we're talking about banks or um, asset management firms or insurance companies who are, you know, in essence financing fossil fuel companies or mining companies, I mean, they couldn't do this work if they weren't being funded. So it's another angle, like we need to pressure the governments, but there's also removing the funds. Um, and, you know, not that we had all this great headway, but we have had some, you know, we put together delegations with wonderful indigenous leaders, um, Shell Cook being one of them, and, you know, got some major divestments after the Credit Access Pipeline, as an example, to get banks to divest. But in the last few years, there's also been this pushback of these anti-ESG, you know, laws, basically, and uh, it's, it's coming from the fossil fuel industry, where banks that are wanting for asset management firms that want to remove their money, they're getting into trouble and you know being you know sued for not being fair business practices because they're being discriminated against. So I know that's a lot of you know nuance to go into, but the reason I'm bringing it up is that I think as we get stronger in wanting to take down these you know dangerous industries, we're also going to see this pushback from the industry, and it's also true culturally as we see with indigenous and black and brown sisters, especially who we work with, there's more pushback, there's more violence in communities um, as these women get stronger and stronger. You know, we know from Global Witness that the rate of attacks on land defenders is increasing, it's not decreasing for women who are protecting their forests or their territories in some other way, or the missing of indigenous women issue has not gone away at all. And so I think that we're seeing this tension building, um, but it, I think it's also a sign that we're getting somewhere. So it's, it's a difficult moment. I, I don't think it's a pretty moment at all. I mean, I'm joyful because of all the things in here and the beautiful people I get to work with. But you know, in my mind, I'm always thinking of the folks in our network who are in desperate situations, literally desperate situations. Um, so I wanted to, to to mention those things, but also. Um, you know, how we kind of get inside this a little bit is that um, I, I think that one of the things that really is like an example to me of how we break some of these patterns is like the land back movement, where we see indigenous people, you know, no more talking, get the land back, get the land back to the original peoples and learn from, as we were hearing, 80% of biodiversity is being protected by indigenous peoples. Well, there's a reason for that, that knowledge of the land. So we're all going to be a lot better off if we respect indigenous territories and lands and indigenous rights. So like those kinds of things, I think, are breaking barriers of, of cultural, um, you know, yeah, cultural walls that prevent us from doing what we need to do, or reparations in black communities led by black communities. Um, and, and what that means, you know, only they can really tell us what that means because of their historical knowledge and in the body experience that we can learn from. Um, I also think um, I want to talk briefly about a few things that are exciting me, but I, I do think it's important too that uh, people who look like me 
need to really understand this is a time for us to be okay with being uncomfortable. I really want to say that. I think that it's good. I'm, I'm learning so much by being vulnerable and being uncomfortable. And I would really encourage it because we're not going to get out of this mess with if, uh, business as usual, you tell the industry, but if we live business as usual in our personal lives and are you know, not looking over uh, at our sisters and brothers of color and indigenous backgrounds, we're, we're, we're not going to move this. We, it's a time we have to change. And that discomfort is good, it's healing, it's growth. It's what we need to be doing. The other thing I wanted to talk about culturally that I really love and one of the things that's been exciting about this week is that we got the Global Alliance for Rights of Nature and all of us and our beautiful sister Shannon Biggs and Natty who's here and the audience and others, Casey, we've all been involved in the Global Alliance for Rights of Nature and I'm really excited about that cultural and legal intervention we're having now of um, looking at how nature needs to be recognized as having rights. And one of the things we've been really calling for this week is if there is the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Humans, which we've had for a long time, which there should be, it's very important, there needs to be a Universal Declaration on the rights of nature, on the rights of Mother Earth. Nature needs to be respected. And I think this is one of the things that we need to shift our conversation is we need to get Mother Earth into the center of the conversation. And that when we do that, things can shift hugely, legally, and in many countries around the world, we now are seeing a huge movement of rights of nature with Ecuador being the first country in the world to put rights of nature into their constitution. But we need to do so much more. But even the Secretary General said that the Earth Jurisprudence Movement is the fastest growing environmental movement in the world. So we're really taking off right now. And I really suggest if you don't know about the rights of nature movement to, to learn more because we have to create a way that we can live in harmony with the natural laws of the earth. We have these ancient agreements in our bones that go back to our ancestors, ancestors. All of us, all of us were indigenous somewhere at some point and had to understand that we have this agreement with nature to live here in a good way. And we've lost those original instructions for the dominant society. And we need to come back to those original um, instructions and that means for me, going back to my own ancestors and learning in our pre-patriarchal, pre-colonized times, what were my people doing? And it's not an easy task to do that. And I don't have to, I don't have time right now to go into the journey I've been on to, to that road, but it has been incredibly important to me to go back to my own ancestors before colonization, before my own people were colonized, before patriarchy, when our when my people were close to the land when my people were praying with Mother Earth. Because then how can I stand here with Casey if I can't stand here fully, even if it's a tattered and torn tapestry I bring? Maybe it's just one egg. My people planted eggs. Maybe I can just bring Casey a painted egg and start there. That's what we need to do to, to change this cultural shift. Um, the last thing I want to say, and I'll pass it along, is that um, when, uh, Rights of Nature was passed in Ecuador. I was really moved. I'd already been studying Point of Year and Suma Kausai, which are a different economic system. I don't think people who originated that, indigenous people called it an economic system, but it's a way of living. And that was put in parallel to Rights of Nature in the Constitution because unless we really dismantle capitalism, there's still going to be people at the top and people at the bottom, to put it simply. And so we need a very holistic new economy that is not based on material and economic growth and have a very different understanding of the economy that's not based on GDP. And that's part of this restructuring we're in, is what's valuable? What do we value? And how can we value different kinds of growth that isn't just through extraction, but is through generosity, through community, through relationship, through all these creative things we can do as humans. And things like your song. That's a great form of exchange. Um, and all kinds of things. So I think that this is also at core is that we're going to have to really understand we need a growth, a, a economic model that is beyond growth, that is post-growth in the traditional sense of economy that, as we think of it. So thanks. I always want to say, what she said. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's.
as a reminder as well, thank you. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we're on stolen lands of the Lenape and the Shinnecock people right now. And that their spirits want to hear their names as well. And that I, you know, I talk a great deal about even getting into acting. That is because of the cultural appropriation or cultural obliteration of the Red Nation's people that are the original inhabitants of Turtle Island, or what's called North America. And we exist in many colors and in many cultures, the ones of us that still exist. And it kind of, I, I, it was a funny thought. I was talking to my youngest son, I think he's 44 now, his name is Jeff Hadamas, his true name. And uh, he said, hey mom, you know, we talk about stolen lands, we talk about land back, because things we talk about, like what if the indigenous people of Turtle Island or North America were the caretakers of Yellowstone? for instance, or any other of the big national territories of the indigenous people that have been stolen, maybe we don't need to ask people to move off of that, but maybe they could say whatever tribe is indigenous to this territory can make the decisions of what is correct here to keep this pristine and beautiful. And he said, also I was thinking about what about that law that was passed in the United States, states about knowingly being in possession of stolen property? What all does that entail? What kind of fines could come from that that would be part of the regenerative funds that are necessary to help the health of all that is. What about paying attention to not just the laws that we want to have in place, but the laws that are already in place within the Western society's viewpoint of, of how they see property laws? Because if they follow their own laws, ooh, it's kind of <laughs> I'm liking it. <laughs> But in reality, to be part of a cultural shift, for me, I'm not an actor, didn't intend to be one. But I was so tired when I was a little child of watching Red Face, you know, watching anybody and everybody play us to the detriment of my spirit and my heart. It was embarrassing, it was disheartening, it was painful to see the depiction of the, of the savage that was an obstacle to be overcome, you know, and, and to have to sit through that as a form of entertainment, or to go into the schools and to have that kind of misconception of what our culture is, is, is just really wrong for you as well. Because you're being told that history that is not true, which gives you a sense of something different than the reality of the natural laws. And another documentary that I participate in is called The Doctrine of Recovery. Because the doctrine of discovery, are you all aware of that? Hands. Hands, okay. It's up to you guys then to educate about uh, 3,000 people a day each. <laughs> That's part of the shift. <laughs> You've got social media, so don't tell me you can't do that. <laughs> the Doctrine of Discovery was a papal bull that happened in the 13th or 14th century, I don't recall exactly when, when the Catholic Church, when the Pope gave permission to anybody that could get here and find us non-Christians who are following the natural law and our original instructions from Wakanda and the earth that they could kill us and take possession of what they call the resources of life. 
And then they did the same thing to our relatives in Africa, in Asia, and all around the globe using a religious format. And so that is part of the recovery that we have to have is to recognize the root cause of this deculturalization of all of us, of you, of the Ponca, of those folks that call themselves leaders and please, I mean, let's don't do that. If we want to talk to power, let's talk to true power. Let's talk to the winds that blow because they're going to define and decide what this world is going to be like in the 10 years. This young lady's talking about 10 years past in the growth. Well, in our world, I don't remember when I was young ever hearing the word environmentalist. It's not in our language, it's just a way of being. I never did hear so many words because they don't exist. We don't have a word for homeless in the Ponca language because those are all our relatives. Somebody's going to take care of them. The ones that we call the orphans, that Wahhabi gave, those were the elders whose parents had passed away. They were not little children without parents because there was always somebody there. There's a whole family uh, in my tribe called the races, the others. We call them, you know, the government called them others because they were the family that always took in those. We didn't have a word that talked about those who didn't follow the same sexual practices as others do. So I don't even follow the jargon of they, them, he, them, that, because each of us is an individual within the natural laws. And that does not mean that I am in charge of who you love, because we all love each other. And that's the way that we're supposed to be. There is a cultural richness to being in touch with all that is that has been robbed from you to try to make you cookie-cutter uh, species, raising cookie-cutter children in a cookie-cutter manner. I'm getting younger now. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, and then we're going to have a reception um, afterwards, so please stay and have, and have cookies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Antonio. Let's give Antonio a big applause. So my remarks went too long. I don't know. Can people hear me? Stop from you. Okay. So, um, yes, I'm really excited to. Uh, announce that this book is coming out. The story is in our bones. How world views of climate justice can remake a world in crisis will be coming out um, right at the end of January. But because of Climate Week, uh, it was just too good of opportunity to share these themes, which is what this whole discussion has been about. Um, and I don't, I don't think I need to say a whole lot. Uh, more because I think you've got the sense of why I wrote the book, which is to look at this big systemic analysis. Um, and um, I hope that you will go on the journey with me. It was really written for our movements. When I took the time to write it, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm writing a book. I was thinking, you know, what's another way that I can offer um, a way to build stronger movements and bring us more towards solutions and harmony with each other and the earth, in addition to the work that I do every day at the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network. Um, you know, what's another way to convey this message of the kind of change that we need in our world? And so it's a, it's a deep dive um, that, that spans many different geographies and peoples and ideas. Um, what I will share briefly tonight, I thought, uh, I talked to my editor and then she had suggested what was good, is I'm just going to tell you, like in a poem, the different chapter titles. Because I will tell you the journey that the book goes on, and then I'm just going to leave it at that. And you can pre-order it. And you'll get a copy of it um, uh, in, uh, you know, towards, towards the end of January. Um, first of all, I'm incredibly thankful that Casey Camp Hornick uh, wrote the um, forward to the book. It's gorgeous. And hear from her presentations. There's no cookies. No cookies in the folder, but there's other great stories and examples from her knowledge. Um, and part one of the book is called Entering the Terrain of Worldview and Climate Justice. And chapter one is called Worldviews are a Portal, and really opening up what are worldviews and how we can understand what they are. The second chapter is the stories in our bones, origin stories to remake our world going into a deep dive about how the stories are in our bones, and I'm not going to tell you, you have to read that part to find out why the stories are in our bones, um, but getting into a deep understanding of how we get to our origin stories. The next chapter is called Ancient Trees and Ancestral Warnings, and how we have, all of us in our different traditions, warnings from our ancestors about how to live in a good way with Mother Earth, and how we have also not been listening to those warnings, and how the trees are also our teachers. A visionary declaration from the Amazon. You heard some from Helena Balinga. Um, one of the things also that's really powerful that has come out of her community in Sariaco is their living forest declaration. Incredibly powerful vision that comes from indigenous peoples about how to live with a forest. The second part of the book, part two, is called Dismantling Patriarchy, Racism, and the Myth of Whiteness, Ancient Mother and Women Rising. And the, chap the first chapter in that section is called She Rises. And it goes into a lot of our pre-patriarchal um, history. The next chapter is Tracing and Healing the Assault on Women. The next chapter is Listening to Black and Indigenous Women and Debunking the, debunking the Myth of Whiteness and then going into worldviews of our ancestral lineages and how, again, we can reclaim our lineage, which is very tied into how um, people identify with white supremacy if they don't have anything else to identify with. And I'll just leave it at that. Part three is reciprocity, a thousandfold act of responsibility and love, and really getting into these concepts that we opened up tonight. The first chapter in that section is called Offering and tending to the land. How do we live a good relationship with the land? 
and then composting the cultural toxins of colonization and capitalism. Reciprocal relationships with people and land. And the fourth part is called Living in Balance with the Natural Laws of the Earth, which goes into a chapter on rights of nature, which you heard about tonight, for systemic change. And then finally, the last section is called The Land is Speaking, Language, Memory, and the Story Living Landscape. And so after sort of going through all these pieces, there's sort of this delicious ending of getting into um, getting into the land in a different way that we all do know still in our bones. And that there's three chapters. One is called Worldviews Conjured by Words, and how our words are literally a way that we are communicating from our spirit, but also communicating with the land, and how in our language, especially ancient languages and indigenous languages, we get into language that connects us directly with the land, and how we can revitalize that language that's married into the land, which affects our mind and our worldview. And then song lines through the landscape, and then finally, building a relationship with the storied land and the story. So I'm gonna leave it at that, and um, thank you so much for taking this time with us and giving a little sneak peek into the book, but most especially for being here for this conversation and these amazing uh, women who I'm so honored to know and um, to, to deepen this conversation and close out our climate week um, on a note that really is much uh, broader in the sense of both our politics but also our cultural understanding and how we can weave these different worlds together that we're all a part of. And as um, Antonia said, I completely agree. What a beautiful audience you've all been. It's just been gorgeous to be here with you, feel your love, feel you riding the waves of the stories with us and all the words that have been spoken. And I wish you all well. And please know that there's lots of food here and everyone is welcome to stay and mingle and talk and uh, be together in community. So, and I'm sure we'll make sure Casey gets some cookies. And um, other than that, enjoy yourselves, and thank you so much for being with us.